Professor Neil Ferguson. Neil is the founder and managing director of the advisory firm Green Mental LLC. Neil's also a Milbank family senior fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University uh, and a senior fa a faculty fellow at the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs at Harvard. Now, many of you will certainly know him as an award-winning author, filmmaker, and columnist. Um, Lawrence, I would say that Neil's arguably most famous work was, of course, when he wrote the foreword to your book, uh, Whom Fortune Favors, a two-volume history of the Bank of Montreal. How's that for a shameless plug? Um, yeah, but his most recent book, Doom, the Politics of Catastrophe, uh, is excellent as well and, and will serve, frankly, as the basis for a lot of our discussion today about doom and risk and extreme events, and more importantly, about possible solutions. Um, we're also going to touch a little bit uh, on Neil's accurate prediction of the development of, of Cold War II. And this is interestingly a prediction that he offered to a group of BMO's senior most leaders on this exact date three years ago. And so we'll get to that a bit as well um, and its implications for extreme risk management. Now, Neil, I could go on and on and on, but with that, uh, a very warm welcome from all of us to today's discussion. Yeah, it's a great pleasure to be with you. Now, Neil, you once wrote, uh, and I'm going to quote this directly to make sure I get it right, that the history of managing risk is a long struggle between our feudal need for financial security in the future and the harsh reality that there is no such thing as, quote, a future in the singular. There are only different unpredictable futures that will never cease to hit us off guard. Now, that, that statement is pretty sobering to those of us who manage risk for a living. Um, but at the same time, I guess history would suggest that despite the many smart and logical things we do to manage risk, we do get caught off guard by an unpredictable events with, with seeming regularity. So I guess my first question is, how, how should an institution um, think about managing that uncertainty risk differently than how we might think about managing risk broadly right now? And then Second part would be maybe what specifically could we be doing better to mitigate the impact of that low probability but highly impl impactful black swan or tail risk event? Well, it's a great question, and I don't want to start off on a doom-laden note. Uh, in, in some ways, it's, it's an illusion that the world is getting more uncertain and more risky and, and indeed more volatile. I think we, we feel that. Uh, partly because of the way we we get news blasted at us 24-7 from multiple directions. And in reality, uh, in some ways, the world is less risky uh, than it was. I mean, I'd rather live in 2021 than in the 1340s, just to throw out an example. In fact, I'd rather live in, in 2021 than in 1921, um, because a lot of risks that you faced 100 years ago uh, we've got pretty good at, at handling, which is why life expectancy has has trended uh, upwards uh, in most places in the past uh, in the past century, in the past multiple centuries. But I think what you need to introduce in a discussion like this is is Frank Knight's distinction between risk and uncertainty. It was a distinction that John Maynard Keynes also accepted uh, in his work. Risk is something calculable. We have a pretty good idea because it's normally distributed about the, the probabilities of, of one of us suffering an automobile accident uh, later today. Uh, that, that's calculable. And an entire industry insurance is built around those, those calculable risks. It's actually quite easy to calculate the risk of, of a hurricane. Hurricanes are actually quite predictable disasters, which are pretty normally distributed. You know when they're going to come. The time of year, and there's actually a, a pretty uh, stable pattern. Uh, there aren't more hurricanes now than there were 100 years ago or 50 years ago. So that stuff is actually relatively straightforward. The problem is the uncertainty, and uncertainties are things to which you can't attach probabilities at all. I, I just know there's going to be an earthquake near where I live. You can tell uh, that I'm uh, in a different time zone because it's still pitch dark here. I'm, I'm in California. I'm pretty near the San Andreas Fault. There'll be an earthquake here at some point, but we have no idea when. We don't know how big it will be. And a lot of things 
uh, exist in that domain of uncertainty. We can't really attach probabilities to them because they're not normally distributed. There is no average earthquake. There's no bell curve that, that tells you uh, the, the kind of average earthquake. And there are no tails really in these distributions of the sort that we get in bell curve distributions. Same applies to a whole range of different things, some natural, some man-made. It's true of wildfires. I have to live with that uh, uncertainty here. And it's true of wars. Uh, we actually see in history that one of the biggest causes of financial disruption is war. But there is no pattern, uh, no predictable cycle of war. And I can't attach a probability to the next big war. Uh, that, that's just not something that we can do. So an organization has to recognize that there's quite a lot of non-calculable uncertainty that it's going to have to deal with. And I think the best way of thinking about this is not to look for some model that is going to tell you spuriously when the next big earthquake or war occurs, but rather to accept that we can't know, but there are a whole range of these different uncertainties. The key is the speed of our response when that first tremor or first gunshot rings out. That, I think, is one of the big lessons of the pandemic, because, of course, pandemics belong in very much the same domain of uncertainty. So, Neil, would you then, um, like, I, to me, there's sort of three approaches to, to dealing with, with uncertainty. I guess you touched on one, which is prediction. Um, is there not... Is there not some types of extreme events, though, that do lend themselves to prediction? And I take your point around um, maybe a little bit more of the obvious ones like hurricanes and earthquakes. But let's say, folk, think about the efforts that governments make to predict things like terrorist events. And, you know, that's all about information gathering and synthesis of huge, 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 huge dreams of data. Is there still a place for that to some extent in that zone of the unpredictable you're talking about? And then secondly, um, if you could touch on preparation. Um, you know, reaction, of course, I think uh, we'll touch on, we'll get to that a little bit more as well, but preparation um, as well for the unpredictable, you know, Jamie Dimon talks famously about, you know, fortress JP Morgan building up these giant walls around the, around the castle, if you will. So no matter what the unpredictable event that happens, you have, you have some kind of defenses set, set up. How do you, how do you feel about those two other elements of it? Well, obviously we want uh, intelligence agencies, uh, and non-public uh, experts to try to get these things right. The problem is that I can I can give you a dozen Cassandras any day of the week predicting uh, disastrous events. Mm -hmm. And uh, the reason that Cassandras, right back to the original Cassandra, tend not to be heeded is precisely that we can't heed them all. Uh, they they tend to predict nine out of the last one financial disasters, uh, financial crises. Uh, and of course, uh, with a terrorist attack, it's it's great if you could anticipate it, uh, but, but you can't in fact anticipate uh, uh, all of the major terrorist attacks. It's too difficult, they're too geographically dispersed, they're really much less frequent than other forms uh, of, of, uh, of, of disaster. So I think it's much harder than we think prospectively to predict retrospectively you can always find somebody who was uh who was saying a disaster's coming uh i know people who've made a career out of predicting the next financial crisis every year for the last 20 years and in 2008 they were right and looked like geniuses uh it's just that they've been predicting it uh, again and again and again since about 2001 uh, and, and Richard Clark was right that 9-11 was coming, uh, but it's very, very difficult uh, for a, a president or national security advisor to be sure because every day somebody is saying a bad thing is going to happen. So that, that's a big problem uh, that, that is often, I think, misunderstood. There's a nice book about this uh, Richard Clark co-wrote with R.P. Eddy about uh, the Cassandra syndrome, uh, but but I think they, they're slightly unrealistic in imagining that we could sort of have a Cassandra officer in every agency, uh, you know, with a crystal ball saying, I see the next 9-11 coming, I see the next financial crisis coming. After about a year, you'd realize that a lot of the things that they predicted didn't happen. So that's, I think that's the, the critical uh, the critical problem. Uh, my sense is that we, we really need to focus much more on, on rapid reaction uh, rather than 
on modeling the future. Uh, let me quote another famous banker, now retired, back at you. Uh, Lloyd Blankfein said to me around the time of the financial crisis, you know, Neil, we weren't actually any more prescient than the other investment banks. But when the crisis began, we were much quicker to act. I thought a lot about that subsequently, because I think that actually is the key. If you are overprepared as a financial institution for disaster, you will almost certainly be uh, excessively liquid and you will have insufficient risk uh, positions. Uh, I know this even from my own investment uh, experience, that the temptation to sit on a pile of cash just in case it's 9-11 or just in case it's Lehman Brothers uh, is a really tempting one if you're you know, somebody who worries about the next uh, Lehman. Earlier this week, the whole world was worried that uh, Evergrande, the Chinese property developer, was the next Lehman. The media were full of Lehman-type uh, scenarios, and none of that materialized. But if you believed it and you sold everything on Monday morning, and I know, uh, I know a Scotsman who writes a lot of history books who did that, uh, then you actually you lost money. Uh, because the whole thing was uh, was greatly, I think, exaggerated as a systemic risk to markets. Uh, so it's it's actually not so much having some great fortress of liquidity. It's much more about being quick on the draw and knowing to try to get out before there's a generalized rush for the exit. Timing, therefore, seems to me much more important than some kind of prescience or prophetic power. Okay, so let's, I want to stay with this theme then, uh, I, I guess in some ways preparedness, because I think you also write that, you know, even with our, um, you know, now fairly voluminous experience with crises, that we actually act, react worse to disasters than ever before. And, and, and this is, I think, central to your thesis. So it sounds to me like we're failing to learn what history is trying to teach us each time one of these crises happen, or maybe we're even learning the wrong lessons. And I guess it's it's probably a fairly safe bet to assume that there's going to be an extreme event in the future. Is there is there a playbook that's sort of forming then, in your mind at least, about how to react to disasters? Are there key elements of that reaction phase um, that will lend to better decisions in the heat of those moments? I think there can be, but we, we have to really learn the right lessons from the last uh, two years. Uh, I think one of the most striking paradoxes of our time is that we've never been uh, better informed and more scientifically uh, aware of the world around us. Uh, we are just far, far better able to understand everything from a, a pandemic to a financial crisis than, than we were 100 years ago. And yet we don't really perform uh, that much better uh, it, it's really remarkable, actually, how poorly we've done in response to COVID-19, uh, particularly countries that were supposed on paper to be really well prepared. And a Canadian audience would enjoy me pointing out that the United States on paper was better prepared for a pandemic than Canada. In fact, it was better prepared for a pandemic than any other country back in 2019 when the Economist Intelligence Unit and Johns Hopkins did a global survey and yet, in fact, the U.S. has performed really quite poorly, almost uh, closer to a Latin American country than, a, than a, a high quality developed northern hemisphere country. And I think the key to that is not that there is a lack of understanding uh, of uh, how a novel coronavirus might, might work. It's that the bureaucratic responses of public health uh, agencies were extremely sluggish and dysfunctional. Uh, of course, there was an easy narrative last year, which was to say it was all Trump's fault because Donald Trump as a populist leader was a, a natural target for, for press uh, criticism. And he made any number of mistakes. But if you look closely, it wasn't really Trump's mistakes that led to the very high excess mortality in the US. Uh, notice also that although Trump has gone and he's been gone since January, uh, the pandemic didn't stop in the United States. We still have really very high levels of death from the Delta wave. Uh, and we're now, you know, past the middle of September. And I think you've got to look much more closely at how, say, the Centers for Disease Control reacted uh, last year, that there was a right way of doing this. You could see it in Taiwan and South Korea, very rapid ramping up of testing. 
use of contact tracing to make sure that you knew who might have been in contact with an infected person, and then rapid and effective quarantining. And the United States did none of those things. Uh, and CDC was, uh, I think, uh, much at fault for failing to make tests available rapidly. It actually prevented non-public entities from producing tests, and then it produced a test of its own that didn't work. Uh, so I think as you read books like my book, Doom, or Michael Lewis's uh, book, or the new book by Scott Gottlieb, you keep realising that actually the bureaucracy really failed. The people whose one job preparedness was did a really poor job of it, despite the fact that they had a 36-page pandemic preparedness plan dating back to 2018, uh, which was the thing that made the US look well prepared. I, I le learn from all of this that there's a very big difference between bureaucratic preparation, readiness on paper, and actual readiness, uh, which is the sort of thing that they had in Taiwan and South Korea. Is that the same, you think, Neil, as saying, well, I, I guess maybe in a way that bureaucracy is, is to some extent the, the enemy of efficiency and effective and timely response in the event of a crisis. So is one potential solution that we ruthlessly dispense with bureaucracy in the event of a crisis and streamline and concentrate decision making? Well, it was very interesting that the successes that happened in the US and also in the UK uh, last year were in uh, vaccine development and early deployment. And actually, in both cases, uh, there were end runs around the, the bureaucracy. You, you created new task forces. In the UK, they brought somebody in from venture capital to run uh, the vaccine pr procurement process. And that worked because it took it out of the doom loop of committee meetings and pseudo preparedness. Dominic Cummings, uh, who for a time was uh, Boris Johnson's uh, key strategist and advisor, has written very interestingly on this because he saw last year uh, up close what was going wrong between the elected politicians, uh, the, the senior civil servants and the public health experts, and that they between them had pretty much the same problems that their counterparts had in the US. Uh, he certainly believes that you have to short circuit these bureaucratic structures in order to get speed of response. And I, I'd say the same is, is clear if you look at Taiwan. One reason it's so agile is that it's very deliberately imported into government. Uh, Audrey Tang, who came from the Occupy movement, was a sort of cyberpunk mm. person. And they said to her, look, if you're so clever, can you apply some of your technological insight two problems of public uh, public uh, provision. And it's worked remarkably well. So I think we need to re-engineer bureaucracy, not scrap it. We can't dispense with it altogether, but we need to really re-engineer it for the 21st century because most countries in the developed world are working with bureaucratic systems that originated in the mid 20th century. And they're really very cumbersome because they've grown larger since the mid 20th century and slower as a consequence. They're highly risk averse and they have a law school mentality about risk, which is all risk is unacceptable. There cannot be risk. We therefore need to regulate it out of existence by producing very complex documents that cover every eventuality. And this actually leads to a kind of, of paralysis. So I think we really need to recognize that we have a kind of sclerotic mid 20th century bureaucracy operating in many areas. And let me give you a financial example. On paper, Banks were highly regulated in the United States in 2007. They're more regulated than other financial entities. And they also were regulated all around the world by Basel rules about capital adequacy. Those rules, which were voluminous, you may remember having to plow through them, failed utterly when a financial crisis happened in 2008. I think it's the same problem, that you, on paper, you have all of this preparedness, uh, and if you'll forgive the expression, ass-covering detail, but in practice, it, it disintegrates on contact with an, an actual crisis. And then you end up uh, basically improvising response on the Federal Open Markets Committee with the, the good fortune to have Ben Bernanke, a historian sitting there, I mean, economic historian who worked on the Great Depression, making the key decisions and basically overriding what were the formal procedures at that point. So I think we can learn a lot, not just from the pandemic, but from that very different crisis that struck in 2008, because we actually failed in rather similar ways in the two cases. Now, 
maybe just one last question on this topic. Clearly, examples like Taiwan are, are extremely powerful. On the other hand, is there any danger in assuming that what worked well in this particular crisis will then, by extension, work well in a future crisis that may not necessarily lend itself or, or expose itself in the same way? Well, Taiwan's a good illustration that you can become a victim of your own success because they did a great job of repressing the spread of, of the virus last year. There literally were 12 people who died of COVID in, in Taiwan in 2020. But when the Delta wave came along, the more contagious variant, uh, they were caught out because they really had left vaccination uh, uh, to one side. There was no demand for it because they didn't seem to have a problem. Uh, and I talked to Audrey Tang earlier this year. I said, how would you assess this kind of failure to, to, to really get serious about vaccination? And she said, we were victims of our own success. Nobody gets a gold medal in the COVID Olympics. Nobody got this absolutely right. Uh, but I think one can learn by just looking back over the last two years, what were the what were the really serious avoidable mistakes and how can we create these more responsive uh, agencies? I think we are still gravely underutilizing technology in most Western democracies. Uh, Audrey Tang's approach, which I think is very interesting, is to say we need to make technology uh, that create greater accountability of the government to the citizens, rather than the other way around. Of course, he or she's thinking of the People's Republic of China, where technology makes citizens more accountable to the government. But I must say, when I travel the world, I'm really struck by how, how slow the public sector has been to ad adopt software. Uh, and when it does use software, it's terrible, by and large. I mean, you know, hands up who's been having fun filling in the multiple electronic COVID forms that are generated by the bureaucracy bureaucracy around the world. So I think we need to kind of uh, re-engineer a lot of public institutions to be much quicker on the draw. And the way to do that is to harness the power of, uh, of technology. My, my sense, in, in other words, is that we do have a solution to many of these problems. It's not, in fact, rocket science. It's just using software tools to make uh, public institutions much more rapid in their responses, whatever form of crisis comes along. All right, let's switch gears then to, uh, to another topic. Um, a recurrent theme in your writing is about networks and, and how in some ways they are quite optimized and yet in other ways they're still actually quite fragile. And you've asserted that some of the greatest problems are things like our international transportation system, obviously highly connected, but then can carry biological contagion or the internet, which you know obviously, as you say, can carry fake news and, and extreme views. I would say the second, maybe even bigger problem of the internet is that, that it also feeds into this risk of hyper connection. And it doesn't really seem like a stretch anymore to say that the risk of financial contagion has significantly increased because of those networks. And, you know, we did learn some very important lessons about interconnectivity during the great financial crisis. And clearly some progress has been made since, but it seems that systemic concentrations actually continue to emerge in, in, in new and maybe even more powerful configurations. So, I guess the question, Neil, is do you think that our current level of concentration, whether that be reliance on internet connectivity, cloud service providers, clearing houses, so on and so on, is exposing us to an extreme risk event? And maybe more importantly, what, what are the countermeasures to this? What do they look like? And um, you know, I guess maybe back to our first conversation, do we be focused on prevention or ability to react or maybe both? Well, this is a really important issue. We, we live in a networked world. Uh, that's a truism. Uh, but what's striking to me is is how little we understand network science. Uh, it's not really a mainstream discipline and it exists in, in, in actually multiple fields. Uh, and uh, it's certainly not something that's, that's taught uh, in your typical college undergraduate program, much less in high school. Uh, and so most people, although they have the word network in their vocabulary, have no idea really what it means. They they use it socially, like I'm just going out networking. Uh, in truth, uh, network science is full of counterintuitive things. Uh, for And I wrote about this in a book called The Square and the Tower. Now, there is actually a natural tendency for social networks to polarize. Uh, that, that's the, the, the birds of a feather flock together problem. Uh, networks have this shape-shifting uh, tendency. They have emergent properties. They're, they're really very odd things when you come to study them. And of course, they're, they're engines for contagion. 
You can't understand the financial crisis without seeing how the international financial network had Lehman Brothers as a very important very nice. node, a, a node with much higher centrality than people realized when they let Lehman Brothers blow up. Uh, in the same way, you can't understand the contagion of COVID-19 until you realize that, that Wuhan had become highly connected uh, to the rest of the world with direct flights going to just about all the major European capitals as well as New York and San Francisco. So I think we need to spend much more time in the public and private sector thinking about networks because they are certainly a much greater source of vulnerability than they were in the past. We are much, much more connected, both in terms of travel and mobility uh, and in terms of, of online connectivity. And this does create new vulnerabilities. Here we definitely are more vulnerable than we were 100 years ago. Uh, because uh, if you just think about what could happen in the next few years that would really catch us up uh, unawares, a, an all-out cyber attack on North America that shut down critical infrastructure, made the internet not work, made your cell phone not work, would be enormously disruptive. Uh, is it inconceivable? No, it's perfectly conceivable. Even a bunch of crooks in Eastern Europe could shut down an entire pipeline uh, on the east coast of the United States just a few months ago. So I think this is one of our new vulnerabilities. And I'll bet you somewhere in the Pentagon, there's a 36-page cyber attack preparedness plan, which will turn out to be completely useless because it probably only exists on a PDF form so that if the cyber attack happens, nobody will be able to access the cyber attack preparedness yeah. plan. And very few organizations that I know of have a drill uh, for what you do if it all goes down. Uh, I mean, I know that I know one that does, uh, but but imagine that's the kind of thing that could happen, uh, and it's in a much tighter time frame than climate change, which the, which is the risk that we spend much much more time discussing. Climate change, if you think about grey rhinos for a minute, grey rhinos are these disasters that you see kind of principally coming towards you. Uh, well, if 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 there were a herd of rhinos, uh, actually, climate change would be the one towards the back of the herd, not moving that fast. Whereas something like a pandemic or a cyber attack is, is coming towards you much faster than climate change. And yet we spend most of our time worrying about that rhino at the back that's trundling towards us at, at actually a relatively slow a relatively slow speed. So that's the kind of thing that makes me fascinated by network science. And I'm more and more convinced, I remember saying this to you the last time we, uh, the last time we were together in real space rather than virtually, that, that any organization needs to understand its internal network and its connectedness to the rest of the world, because only by graphing the network can you see where the vulnerable nodes are. And that comes right down to which individual uh, would really create a big hole if they fell ill. Uh, and sometimes organizations don't appreciate who the key people are until one of the key people is suddenly is suddenly not available. So by simplifying too much, Neil, to, to, to suggest that for us, um, you know, particularly in, in large financial institutions, you know, un, certainly deeply understanding those network effects where we have gaps and vulnerabilities. And then, um, you know, a, apart from maybe just sort of traditional type of playbooks, moving all the way into full blown simulations yeah. um, and, and uh, you know, almost war games, if you will, uh, to imagine kind of those worst case scenarios. Yeah, I think exactly right. We don't do enough drills. I notice at my university, I get a lot of so-called trainings, which are extremely tedious uh, videos that I have to click through, but I don't get any drills. Now, we need here to learn from the military. Uh, the military, historically, has been much more aware that uh, disaster is costly, because if you have a military disaster, uh, your soldiers get dead or taken prisoner. Uh, and so the incentive in the military is to train and drill and make sure that when combat happens, your people have done so much combat training that they don't really have time to, to be fearful. They, they get on with their jobs. In the civilian world, we don't do that. Uh, there, there are virtually no drills. Even when I was a kid, we did more drills. We did actual fire drills at my school in Glasgow, and we would periodically have the bells go off and everybody had to get out the classroom and go stand in the playground and the pouring rain, remember it was Glasgow. I mean, it doesn't happen at Stanford. There are no drills. Uh, I remember feeling the same thing at, at Harvard. There were no there were no drills for a terrorist attack, even in the period around the time of the Boston Marathon bombings, when a terrorist attack on the Harvard campus was really not an, 
unrealistic scenario. So I think simulations, drills, getting people to think about it, these are the things that can make uh, you quick to respond. Whereas if you haven't practiced, you know, our, our street keeps talking about how we really need to prepare for an earthquake, but, but we don't really do it. We don't really run the simulation. I think there's, there needs to be much more of that kind of almost military approach to getting ready for the, the, the kind of the nightmare scenario. Uh, and, and let me add another point. What typically goes wrong in the case of contagion is that there are no circuit breakers. Now, if there had been circuit breakers in early January 2020, if there had been early uh, interruptions of travel from Wuhan, we could perhaps have contained the pandemic. Uh, but the fact was that the flights kept flying right the way through towards the end of January. Uh, and by that time, the virus was everywhere. Uh, mainly because of a cover-up by the Chinese authorities, which meant that we lost precious weeks. But if you look at financial uh, contagion, the need for circuit breakers is, is quite well known. And some circuit breakers exist in the financial system, but I suspect not enough. Uh, so I think one needs to look at the network and say, well, what would happen if, I mean, this is the kind of thing that you do a lot if you're into software, cybersecurity. What, what would you do if there was really an infected node and you had some kind of malware? You, you'd very quickly want to uh, put a cordon around that node and cut it off. Uh, we need to be aware that networks have to have circuit breakers if contagions to be to be stopped. And let me add a final point. One reason that we've done quite badly in the last year and a half is that there has been there's been a parallel infodemic of fake news about the virus, about the vaccines. And that's a new problem that didn't really exist in, say, the 1950s. Uh, and I think we don't think enough about how contagions of magical thinking, let me use that term, can really disrupt our response to a crisis because we've created uh, in the form of institutions like Facebook really powerful engines for the spread of disinformation and misinformation. And nobody has figured out how to regulate that problem. Clearly, censorship isn't the answer, but we better come up with some answer or each crisis will be accompanied by a contagion of, of craziness which will make the public response and, and indeed the private response much harder. Well, thank you for that, Neil. I, I couldn't agree more. And I really like the points, especially about simulations and drills. Um, you know, often I think preparedness stops at the playbook and, um, you know, that's just not the same thing as having, uh, you know, having people that are, are trained, really. Um, I've done a lot of the talking now, so I think uh, maybe I should cede the floor to my more learned colleague, uh, Dr. Musio. Over to you. Thanks very much, Pat. Uh, we've been talking a lot about uh, in the first uh, 20 minutes or so about about action and response and uh, possible solutions, and it's been really uh, fascinating. But I'd like to come to, to, the, uh, to that question from a thought or, or decision making process perspective, because, you know, your, write, your writings, especially in the latest uh, in your latest book, Doom, uh, is uh, about the story of risk and how we face the music and make decisions when disasters disasters happen. Okay. And then you also list uh, five possible failures that condemn societies to getting it all wrong when it comes to disaster. And we've kind of rehearsed these uh, in the in the last few minutes, but it's failure to learn from history, failure of imagination, tendency to fight the last war or crisis, uh, 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 underestimating uh, and procrastination, which uh, you've uh, you've talked about eloquently in the last uh, last uh, half an hour or so. So, and I think that really does capture uh, overall the public policy response in the North Atlantic world. And so, and one of the reasons that the Long Run Institute has conferences like this one is certainly that we, that we, you know, continue to fall prey to any one of these five failures if we don't prepare decision makers for doing better. So, the, the question would be, uh, you know, what are the, what are the lessons we should be adopting for, for strategic and risk focused decision making in the context of these emerging risks, and especially with a with a view to applied history uh, and using it as a kind of a super forecaster. Well, I, I'm not saying this just to uh, make you happy, Lawrence. I think history has to be a, a key part of how any organization uh, thinks, because if we only rely on our experience as individuals, uh, the data set will be too small. 
Uh, it's in the nature of, of uncertainty that, that the kind of events that we have to grapple with are not necessarily events we've experienced before in our lives. Uh, although there had been a major pandemic in our lifetimes, which was HIV AIDS, it was very different in nature uh, from COVID-19. Uh, you had to really be able to remember 1957-58, which was the last time a really major respiratory pandemic, a pandemic of respiratory disease happened. And uh, not many many of us do have clear memories of, of 1957. So I think the, the, there has to be in any organization some kind of inbuilt historical uh, component that, that kind of forces people to think about the long run. And, and that exposes them to this much larger data set. Uh, I remember in 2007, eight, struggling to communicate to people what a really big financial crisis would be like. In fact, I, I can remember almost being pelted with bread rolls when I talked about the coming crisis in late 2006 at a Morgan Stanley conference in Lyford Quay. Uh, so it's quite hard to convince people uh, that big disasters can happen if they if they haven't lived them. Uh, and most people in the markets in 2007 had careers that began in like 1982. And they basically lived through this extraordinary bond bull market. They, they'd lived through the, the great moderation as it was rather misleadingly cold. And they couldn't quite imagine something like 1929. Uh, so I think getting some kind of historical perspective into an institution is very important because it sensitizes you to the, the black swans that do periodically land, but they, they don't land so often that you, you can base your response on, on your own 30, 40 years of career. Uh, I couldn't agree more. You'd be uh, shocked to, uh, to, to hear. Um, I think the, uh, one of the great difficulties is the, that the system is stacked against historical thinking because it's all kind of levered to, uh, to short and medium term thinking. And when institutions think of, about the long term, uh, they're thinking about it uh, in the sense of uh, that PDF that you were talking about in terms of preparedness. So it's a beautiful thing on paper that doesn't, that doesn't seem to have uh, much purchase in the real you know, de strategic decision making world. Uh, so uh, let, me, let me pivot though, because I have two other, you know, I have context uh, and two other C's, and the the next C is uh, is China. Uh, uh, the emergence of Cold War II uh, between China and the United States is uh, is a topic that you're increasingly kind of turning to uh, uh, over the last few years. Uh, since you started talking about this, the geostrategic picture is, I think, considerably darkened. Uh, there are significant. Uh, uh, say disinformation campaigns, even election disinformation campaigns that are, are emerging in the in the Canadian case. We have uh, this week uh, uh, Japan's defense minister, uh, who is kind of saying that China's become increasingly powerful politically, economically, militarily, and was attempting to use its power unilaterally to change the status quo. So, uh, uh, and that has obviously uh, first, second, and third order effects. When we're talking about uh, global shipping and you know the waters and islands claimed by other other nations and so forth, and so perhaps I can get you to talk a little bit about Cold War II as it connects to the way in which we think about risk and what should we expect, uh, you know, in the you know in the short and medium term, because I think that that's uh, that's something that maybe people aren't uh, aren't focused on just uh, or just just yet. Well, of course. Uh uh, only this week, President Joe Biden said uh, in New York, uh, we don't want a, a new Cold War, which is just the kind of thing you say in the early stages of a new Cold War. Uh, I started talking about this about three years ago, and, and audiences were initially kind of a little uh, surprised and, and disinclined to agree. But it seemed to me obvious uh, back in 2018 that what had begun as a trade war had morphed into something much broader it was a technological conflict, uh, more than just a, a, a race. It was a geopolitical uh, uh, rivalry, to put it mildly, in places like the South China Sea. And it had become increasingly ideological, not least because Xi Jinping has really moved the People's Republic of China back to a more Marxist-Leninist uh, framework, uh, to an extent that people in the West tend to underestimate because they only hear the public pronouncements directed at the West. They don't hear the kind of thing 
that is said by China's leaders internally. So for all these reasons, I felt Cold War II was beginning. And the end of towards the end of 2019, I asked Henry Kissinger at a conference in Beijing uh, if he thought, uh, as somebody with quite a lot of experience of Cold War I, we were in a Cold War. And he said, we're in the foothills of a Cold War. Earlier uh, this year, he upgraded that, upgraded that to the mountain passes of a Cold War. So if Henry Kissinger thinks we're in the mountain passes of a Cold War, I think we should all pay attention. Uh, and, and if you talk to my Chinese counterparts, people who work on international relations or economics and the big Chinese universities, there's really not much doubt about this, although they, they may tweak the language here and there, that Chinese are much more aware of this, uh, of this phenomenon and recognize that there's something very like a Cold War now underway. And my sense is that the big historical significance of the pandemic has been to intensify this and make it more apparent, not least because the pandemic originated in China under pretty suspicious circumstances, which we, we may never have entirely clarified. And also because after that, I think the Chinese government very aggressively with its so-called wolf warrior diplomacy uh, tried to change the narrative so that it somehow wasn't China's fault. And I don't think that worked at all well. So we're in, I think, the early stages, the uh, the mountain passes, if not the foothills of, of, of Cold War. And that has profound implications uh, for everybody, for every country, uh, including those allied to the United States, and, and for every business, because all businesses, by and large, have some exposure, if only indirect, to China. Uh, if the U.S.-China relationship is going to go the way of the U.S.-Soviet relationship from the late 1940s, which was towards the brink of war, and indeed in the case of Korea, actual war, uh, then I think we need to prepare ourselves for a lot more geopolitical volatility than we have grown used to. I mean, true, after 9-11, the U.S. involved itself with its allies uh, in some major wars, but actually they weren't that big. The truth about the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan is that by historical standards, they were small wars. Uh, and uh, to an historian, more like colonial policing operations. A big war is something we've kind of forgotten about. A war between two superpowers, uh, as Jim Stavridis has pointed out in his new book, would be a really big deal. Uh, it would involve, for example, if the Chinese invaded Taiwan, a full-blown naval war uh, with aircraft carriers uh, and uh, and uh, battleships tussling in and around the Taiwan Strait. It would be an air war in which the U.S. would have to take out significant uh, Chinese mainland bases in order to establish dominance of the air. But it would also be a cyber war. It could be a war in space. It's a much bigger deal than we've grown accustomed to because it's been so long since we saw a really big war. It's really not since the Korean War that there's been anything of comparable magnitude. So I think we're not giving this enough thought, uh, partly because we don't want to face this kind of inevitable uh, descent into Cold War, but also because we've forgotten the very important historical point that Cold Wars are not always cold. Uh, and what made Cold War I intelligible to many people was actually the outbreak of war in Korea in 1950 which was five years after George Orwell had first used the phrase Cold War. The, uh, the historical parallels are, are truly chilling uh, and, and fascinating. Uh, the, the, perhaps the difference might be, you know, in terms of the USSR, US uh, Cold War and uh, the China, uh, China, United States, uh, the Cold War II, is the tremendous interconnectedness of, uh, of those systems that you talked about earlier, that kind of hyper-connection. Uh, and so it will, it, it, it complicates matters, does it not? Uh, because of, you know, trade links and, you know, investment. And uh, we see even this morning in the, in the news, uh, Evergrande uh, is, uh, is causing um, a lot of column inches to be expended in, uh, you know, in newspapers and so forth. Yeah. I think the fact of interconnectedness, what I used to call Chimerica, the interconnection of the US and the Chinese economies doesn't make Cold War impossible any more than the interconnectedness between Britain and Germany in 1911 made a world war impossible. Uh, you can get to decoupling much faster than most people realize. It's also worth saying that interconnectedness makes espionage much easier for China than it was for the Soviet Union. It was really quite hard for the Soviet Union to find out stuff that was going on at the cutting edge of American technology, it's really easy for China because there are enormous numbers of 
of Chinese uh, citizens in different parts of uh, of the U.S. technology sector. So I don't think this interconnectedness precludes Cold War II. It just makes it different. Uh, but of course, World War II was different from World War One. It was still World War, and I think Cold War II will be different in lots of ways from Cold War One. But it'll still be Cold War in the sense that there will be instead of a, a nuclear arms race, a quantum computing and artificial intelligence arms race. Just to give you one example of how it, how it'll be different. Uh, but my sense is that this has very much larger financial implications than Cold War One. Cold War One, it's interesting, didn't really have a financial dimension because what could you do to hedge against nuclear Armageddon? Nothing. You just had to kind of get on with life and hope it didn't happen. Uh, and there was no kind of Soviet bond trading on Wall Street uh, at any point. Whereas we now have a situation in which our principal strategic rival adversary, China, uh, has all kinds of uh, uh, of assets that are trading in dollar markets offshore. And, and indeed, there are major uh, Chinese entities still trading on Wall Street, on U.S. indices. So I, I think it makes it actually financially much more problematic. If there were a war over Taiwan, let's just imagine, and this is the scenario that one hears most frequently raised by the military folks, that would be enormously destabilizing to financial markets, not least because the U.S. would really have to use financial sanctions to punish China uh, for an invasion. So I think one really obvious implication is that Cold War II will be much more financially uh, destabilizing than Cold War I ever was. Yes, very interesting. And uh, let me let me introduce another another connection to to China, and that is um, climate, uh, climate change. Uh, in an interview you gave uh, about two weeks ago now in Handelsblatt, um, you spoke to climate change as a possible front for Cold War II, and you shared your concern that through our climate fears, we may be neglecting all of the other emerging risks. So we're focusing on maybe one or two of the most appealing categories of, of uh, contemporary risk. And so uh, how, does, how does Cold War II relate to, to climate change? And what are the, because the climate change is very much, you know, in the, you know, uh, in the, in the sites of, uh, of the North Atlantic world, especially with Glasgow, especially with uh, the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero and so forth. And so there is a, a momentum happening here to mitigate that, say, existential risk. But you say, hold on a second, there is, uh, you have to take a step back and see the larger context, larger geostrategic context. I always think it's sort of ironic to hold a, a, a conference on climate change in Glasgow, because people in Glasgow have been praying for climate change for centuries and, uh, and, and hoping that something would happen to stop the incessant rain. Uh, but to be serious, as we get closer to COP26 next month, the conversation is going to be dominated more and more by climate issues. And uh, no doubt we'll be hearing from Greta Thunberg and, and other radical climate activists. And no doubt uh, she and they will be renewing their calls on the United States, uh, Canada, the European countries to reduce their emissions. But I'll be interested to hear if she has any similar words for the Chinese government uh, because if you look at the data, uh, it's clearly China that's responsible for the lion's share of the increase uh, in CO2 emissions in Greta Thunberg's lifetime. Two thirds of the increase in CO2 emissions since 2003, when she was born, are due to China. And 93% of the increase in coal consumption, 93% was due to China. So there's a very interesting problem that is emerging in climate debates and climate policy. Ultimately, there is no obvious way of constraining China. If China says one thing, but continues to do another, that's to say promises to be carbon neutral, zero carbon, but ends up continuing to build coal burning power stations, there is nothing anyone can do. There are no constraints, there are no sanctions uh, that currently exist. That problem is gonna become more and more obvious in the context of Cold War II, and it's already, I think, interesting that John Kerry has started, to my amazement, saying there's a China piece to this problem. And he needs to say that much more loudly, uh, because we have to recognize that if North America and Europe continue in the different ways that they plan to do to reduce their 
uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and China does nothing but carries on building the coal-burning power stations, we are not going to avoid the worst-case scenario that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has been warning about uh, for uh, the better part of, of more than a quarter of a century. So I think this is a huge, huge issue, and it's going to become more and more political because the Chinese are really doing uh, a quite different thing from the thing they say that they're doing. They're essentially saying, make us virtuous, it's the St. Augustine line, please make us virtuous, but not yet. Unfortunately, we have to take action now. We can't let China carry on charging its Teslas with electricity generated by burning coal for the rest of this decade, and only in the 2030s do something about it. That's what's got to change. So I really hope this discussion on climate ceases to be one in which people in the West beat themselves up for not doing more and becomes one in which we say, you know what, if China doesn't act, our own efforts are not going to make the fundamental difference that's needed. I'll, I'll hand it over to, uh, to my co-chair, Pat, uh, for, the, for the last uh, couple of minutes, and then we're gonna go to uh, a question and answer session. Uh, thank you very much, Neil. Thanks, Lawrence. I think, given how sh we're we're running a little tight on time, Lawrence, so I'm going to go right to Q and A, and then uh, if we have a little more time, maybe I can come back to a question of my own. Um, so we got a couple of questions from our audience, Neil, and um, one I, I think is interesting. I guess I guess to to bankers and to any to, to those of us who work in a regulated industry, but the question asks: some of the focus on advanced preparedness is driven by regulators. Um, and so what would be a more progressive and pragmatic approach regulators could take, given that agility and speed of response seems to be a stronger driver of better outcomes? I would love to see a change in the culture of, of regulation. I, I wish that since the financial crisis, we had recognized the extent to which over complex regulation is the disease of which it pretends to be the cure at best. And at worst, it actually exists to create barriers to entry uh, to new institutions and to reduce competition. Ultimately, we should be looking to get to a world in which regulation is relatively simple. Uh, regulators have, have power, they have discretion, but the regulations themselves are straightforward and easy to understand and relatively concise. If we did anything wrong, it seems to me, since 2008, it's been simply to create new layers of complexity uh, in the regulatory environment. Just look at Dodd-Frank if you want to see the ultimate dog's breakfast uh, of regulatory complexity that doesn't really address the problems uh, that led to the financial crisis. I I've been arguing since I reissued the Ascent of Money in 2018 that the only thing we really addressed was bank capital adequacy and almost all the other causes of the crisis were not addressed other than in ways that I think potentially have made the problems worse. So I keep looking for a, a role model in this area. Uh, Switzerland is interesting because I think much Swiss, Swiss regulation and Swiss law has the merits of simplicity and clarity. Uh, unfortunately, Swiss, Switzerland is quite rare in this respect. Uh, last point, look at the battles that are being fought right now over cryptocurrency and the ways in which regulators around the world are adopting a kind of if-it-moves regulated approach. Uh, there's a significant risk that the US prevents innovation in fintech and especially in blockchain-related decentralized finance because the regulators have this sort of mentality, uh, which we hear from Gary Gensler on the SEC, essentially, I decide what is a security, and if I say it's a security, it's a security, but I won't tell you until I tell you it's a security. I mean, this kind of mentality is really, I think, very hostile to innovation. Now, I guess I certainly would never uh, presume to speak for a regulator, but I do suspect if they were here, they might say, um, you know, we did have a simpler and certainly maybe more principles-based approach to regulation in, in prior regimes. And you know, it's maybe human nature to then therefore find the loopholes and the gray zones, and particularly in principles space. And so we've now shifted much more to very prescriptive and unfortunately complex regulation. But do you see kind of a trade off between those two things? Oh, there is. If you go back to uh, the late 19th century, when London was the center of the world's financial system, uh, and the first stage of globalization was reaching its zenith, 
read Walter Badgett's account of how the financial system worked, it's really striking that it worked tremendously well without terribly much regulation. Uh, the principal regulation were uh, was provided by the uh, governor of the Bank of England's eyebrows, uh, which proverbially would be raised if uh, if it was felt that a financial actor was was crossing the not very visible red lines. Now, I'm not suggesting that we can just rely on Jay Powell's eyebrows or Gary Gensler's uh, at the SEC, but I do think uh, simpler regulation with powerful uh, uh, regulators who have discretion might produce better outcomes than incredibly complex regulation that unfortunately gives an advantage to the big institutions that can afford to have enormous compliance departments. And the growth of compliance, I don't need to tell you this, has been one of the most striking consequences of the financial crisis. Enormous numbers of people whose job it is essentially to make sure that the institution is compliant with an absolute mass of regulatory complexity. It's to my mind, the definition of a fragile system, that it has such regulatory complexity. Uh, it's also highly, I think, inimical to competition. Uh, we stopped creating new financial institutions in the United States. And there's a reason for that. It goes back to your friend, Jamie Dimon, whom you met earlier. And one of the real fortress-like uh, uh, structures around JP Morgan is this moat of regulation that makes it extremely difficult for new entrants to compete with JP Morgan in offering financial services. That can't be that can't be healthy. That is not the sign of a healthy economy. It's actually a sign of an oligopolistic uh, economy that increasingly entrenches a handful of really big players by making the regulation so complex that nobody else can play. Well, Neil, I know uh, I certainly speak for everyone who joined the conference today that uh, we've learned an enormous amount from your experience and your insight. Um, personally, I'm grateful for your commitment to speaking with us today, your clarity and your authority on, on these complex and, and sometimes risky subjects is clearly uh, supreme. And um, it's that angle of vision and pattern recognition that you bring to these tough questions that we are uh, we are absolutely grateful for and want to thank you for your participation and your engagement in today's discussion. So thank you on behalf of the entire audience, Neil. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks, Pat. Thanks, Lawrence. Great to see you.